So this is my natural habitat. Uh, given a choice, this is where you will find me. Um, but about uh, 10 years ago, I uh, went off on a journey that involved identifying artistic language that could assist scientists in understanding their data, specifically um, uh, earth and climate, climate data. Um, so the language of art is a distillation of the world in which we live. And so is a visualization, a distillation of the science. And so I got started at the Texas Advanced Computing Center, where they later hired me, um, working on pandemic flu visualization. This was 10 years ago. And, um, but then Los Alamos picked up on the work and said, yeah, you belong with us. So um, I arrived, and this is what sat outside of my office door. Now, I'm a colorist, so this was hard for me. All of the data that you're going to see in the next slides is the same data set, OK? The same data. So what we did was build color tools that would enable us to color and highlight what the scientists needed to see within their data. Um, and so th these are the eddies that are crossing um, the ocean. So that was step one. Step two involved they really wanted to see the three-dimensional data. And my, um, my t sort of normal thing was, well, why can't we do that? Um, and, and we did, um, basically because I, I didn't understand that that was a hard thing to do. Um, but <laughs> you know, what can I tell you? So, but then they gave me a bigger challenge. Now, this is a multivariate data set where each variable has a scalar value and it moves over time. And I thought, oh, that made my head hurt, please. So these are uh, science scenes from outside my window at Los Alamos. It's a beautiful spot. And I'm looking out there, I'm saying nature is complex, but it encodes in a calming fashion. Why can't we use the encodings of nature and apply them to data? So that's exactly what we did. What you're looking at has the exact same information as the coffinous thing you saw before. And now imagine that it moves over time. You've got to have the calm to be able to follow. So with that success, we developed a series of uh, color maps, discrete color maps, different things that are drawn from nature and can be applied to data. And, um, and those are all available um, on our website. So my training actually is as a sculptor. And so while there's color is important for encoding data, so is shape, form, and texture. These are um, microscopic animals that dance down the Niagara River right out of graduate school, um, my work. So you can see on the, on the left, these are the symbols that we use to encode data. But the world is full of an unlimited number of rich shapes and textures. And so what we did was, uh, over four years, don't, don't get me wrong, developed a program where we could put my sculptures onto data. And this is real data. It's large data. It runs on the supercomputers. It, it has multiple variables. Um, and it's uh, time varying and three dimensional. This is the Gulf of Mexico. And it's a group of scientists that are looking to identify spots that could um, be productive for macroalgae growth uh, for biofuels. And what they need to do is they need to identify within the three dimensional spaces of the Gulf of Mexico where are there enough nitrates, where are the, the eddies to hold them together, and where is the chlorophyll which identifies where they think it will be likely. So um, the, the streamlines are colored by nitrate levels, and the curly guys are the chlorophyll, um, and the other guys are the nitrates. But then, not resting on our laurels again, uh, we know that we absorb information intellectually, but to really deeply understand it, we need to connect with it emotionally. So using these tools, I began to explore um, that boundary that sits right between art and science. And in art, we often talk of ourselves as being context makers. And so this is ice. This is about the water underneath the Antarctic ice sheets. It's data. Um, this is back to the Gulf of Mexico. And it's about how the nitrates are impacting not just the aquatic life, but also the birds that depend on the fish and that sort of thing. It's a whole series of work. This is just a still. Um, and then I finish with. The, the way, um, the, when I look at a lot of geoscience data, it's, it's two-dimensional because it's hard to visualize three-dimensional data. But what we've done is we've taken volumetric data and sampled it by density and applied the glyphs to it. So if you can imagine, there's a little bubble around each one of those glyphs. And that indicates how much of that specific variable is located in that spot. 
And because we've done this, you can swim through the three-dimensional data and still understand what's happening.